Hey, what's up everybody? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. Well, it's finally time to make my most massive video yet, where I review a particular set of soundbar systems that could plausibly cause a career ending injury. I'm not out of the woods yet. Were these four systems I'm about to compare provided to me? Obviously yes, by Amazon after I paid them. The Contenders, the 2021 Klipsch Cinema 1200 $4,000, so much hype, even more snub. What went wrong? Was the 1200 treated fairly? We'll dig into that. Next, the 2020 Sonos Arc with two Sonos Ones and a Gen 3 sub costing you $1,950 from Sonos if bought as a set. Third, the $1,900 2022 Samsung Q990B. The third and recently uncarpeted entry in the very popular and formidable Q900 series. Last, the enigmatic Don't Give a Fig 2021 Sony HTA9, a four speaker system coupled with the Sony SA-SW5 base module, total cost $2,300. Is the A9 a one-off or the radical new direction the industry should follow? I'll give you my two cents at the end of the video. And about those prices, they've all changed multiple times just while preparing for the review, driving me nuts. I cited the US manufacturer's price at the day of this recording. The prices vary by day and region, often dramatically. So if it's too expensive, check again tomorrow. Now, if you're my one super fan, you're surely aware that I've given each of these systems a dedicated review. You can find those in the description. For this comparison, I won't go into the same kind of detail. Rather, I'll pursue an earnest reassessment to steer you in as prudent a direction as I can given the current state of these systems and my latest wisdom on how to judge these things. The outline, I'm gonna rank stuff. Aesthetics, design and build, this matters. What we surround ourselves with and its beauty or lack thereof has psychological and or marital ramifications. End of story. Second, a broad category I'm calling utility. So a highish level review of the specs accompanied by my edifying commentary for those just embarking on their soundbar curious journey. Third, user experience, which system is least or most likely to fly out a window kind of thing. Fourth, audio, I'll rank by cinema, music, and overall sound performance. Fifth, I'll wrap up by declaring the overall best bar, money is no object. Design and build, starting with the Klipsch Cinema 1200. As you can see, it takes on the traditional Klipsch soundbar form cladded in an itchy sweater covering the front, top, and bottom. You'll find the obligatory Tractrix horn on each end, which serve both form and function. On the very ends of these horns sit replaceable wooden end caps. The right cap hides the service port. On top are two shiny circles outlining two height drivers. Height drivers and shiny circles are unique to the Cinema 1200. Having owned this system for well over a year, it's clear this bar wants to settle into a humble, homely, bless your heart kind of look, as the wool sweater is not merely uncomfortable, but a supernatural magnet that attracts anything and everything. Personally, I have limited interest in grooming my soundbar for a dog show, so it looks bad, but more responsible owners may feel compelled to keep up appearances. The bar is quite wide at 54 inches and is unusually deep at 6.2 inches. So this could impact your well-laid plans to fit it somewhere in your house. Measure carefully. The bar is built with real wood material, which a naive person might just shorten to wood, but I don't think that is technically correct. In any case, the build quality is sturdy. The rears, largely the same story as the bar. The same wood material accents, right angles, the same scratchy sweater. The footprint is within the normal range, but it stands noticeably taller than the bulk of its peers. I imagine when the 1200 was being envisioned, an eager executive stormed in and made his desires known using only grunts. The staffers wanting to speak the same language pleaded with smaller grunts, but that backfired and merely inflated the executive's grunt response. The sub is the biggest grunt. It's a wooden cabinet mega monolith. It's massive with a 16 by 16 inch base and stands 20.2 inches high. While the 12 inch downward firing woofer would airlift wimpier sound equipment, it's 46.5 pounds of pure bassy stuff keeps it earthbound. 
Even though the build comes across as a little Eagle Scout-ish, all the components feel sturdy. Though, one leg on the base has come a bit loose and the rubber padding had to be glued back on. So I'm not super impressed with that particular execution. The Sonos Arc, it's elegant while not calling too much attention to itself. Okay, the white one's a little prissy. It's eponymous with its rounded 270 degree curve. So Arc, not A-R-C, which is an important home theater acronym we'll touch on later, but unrelated to the system's name. The ENDS house side firing speakers that have a slight concavity to them. It has 76,000 holes drilled into the housing. It's all plastic, but the striking sturdiness makes it quite plain that not all plastics are created equal. It's certainly much wider than its predecessor, the Play Bar, but narrower than most other flagship soundbars. The rears, in this case the Sonos Ones, are the smallest rear speakers in this comparison, but not the lightest, being 4 pounds and 33% heavier than the 1200 rears. They got some, let's say, reassuring gravity, given the size. The grill is plastic and covers the front and sides. There is not a grill on top, just speaker controls, mainly for when they are not paired with the Arc. This is a good cue that these speakers were not specifically designed to extend the Arc's 3D audio vertical effects. I'll riff more on that later. All in all, this speaker design introduced over 10 years ago, yikes, holds up fairly well and was certainly boosted by the facelift in 2017. The Gen 3 sub, which was released the same time as the Sonos Arc, so June 2020, is the smallest of the four subs, but again, not the lightest at 29 pounds. It keeps the signature missing middle look introduced in the first gen, which leaves room for the two force canceling drivers, which keeps the thump without making those below feel as if they're in a bomb shelter. Its design leans toward tasteful modern art piece. Let's just pretend that's a category. And it's constructed largely from a proprietary resin that categorically gives it a premium feel. The ARC home theater ensemble is impressive and looks and build. Hard to knock it. The Samsung Q990B. The bar I'd say has amongst the highest marks and touch and feel amongst the everything in one box kits, which is kind of a humble looking crew. It's made mostly of metal and has a full face grill on six of its eight sides. It keeps the same dimensions and hexagonal form as the Q950T and A, but the B looks so much better in metal than what that is. The rears? Also impressively built, and surprisingly, holding more weight per volume than the Sonos Ones. They're encased in the same metal material as the bar. Relative to the previous models, the rears got an injection of personality, and they're just more crafted and detailed. For example, with the sound-enhancing curved grills on the top and side. And it sits on this little pedestal. How cute. The Sub, it's a dulling gray, monotone sensory assault with the glaring exception of this alluring raised saucer, which Samsung terms an acoustic lens. Gotta love new jargon. Anyway, the lens raises the sub from the banal to the occasional, hey, is that a subwoofer? From your friends. Yes, it is, friend. It is. And I definitely have friends. The design and build gets a check mark and is a full step above average considering the broad landscape. All right, last, the Sony HTA9 with the SA-SW5 submodule. The control box is an enlarged Apple TV with sick fence. The front half and top of each of the four speakers are all grill. The back half is covered in this sandpaper-like material. It feels frankly a little out of place and makes you wonder why you're $2,000 kit feels a little bit like it's meant to prep walls for a paint job. Anyway, the speaker's appearance is half striking and half neutral. Striking in that they have a very atypical aspect ratio, kind of slim given that they're over a foot tall, and they're round with a slice cut out in the back, which is unusual for a home theater speaker. Though, at the same time, it's given a stylish but subdued coloring, so it can perhaps more convincingly blend into off-white walls. The design and build is perfectly fine, but I did expect a more premium feel for the $2,000 from both the speakers and the control box. Just being honest. The SA-SW5, the submodule, 
It's nice looking, rounded corners, and covered largely in this faux grain leather with fine acoustic fabric on the front and back. But why the back? The front grille hides a 180 millimeter driver and under this raised area is a complimentary downward facing passive radiator. It's unique, looks decent, built well, doesn't seem to have much in common with the A9 stylistically, other than they share the omnidirectional block design label, which means they're a single block and have rounded edges. Sort of. Ranking. Sonos is the most artfully crafted and consistently refined across the four components. Build quality is unquestionably strong. Visually, the Arc system will evoke the greatest amount of envy. Second, third, and last, the HGA9, Q990B, Cinema 1200, respectively. Channel count. I sense I need to sneak it in here, but I don't know where to put it in my outline. The Cinema 1200. The bar is a 3.0.2 channel speaker, which means three channels shooting horizontally, namely the left, center, and right channels. There are zero bass channels integrated into the bar and two channels projecting sound up and off the ceiling to imposter overhead ceiling speakers. Each rear speaker is a 1.0.1 speaker with an ear and height channel. So along with the sub, you're looking at a 5.1.4 system, 10 channels. The ARC is a 5.0.2 speaker with a left, center, and right channel in the front, along with the left and right surround channel on the sides. When you add the Sonos Ones, both 1.0 channel speakers, the system transforms into a, you guessed it, a 5.0.2 sound system. Yes, the ARC, for whatever reason, is not a 7. whatever enabled, so when you add surrounds, what happens is the directional ear level channels, so left and left surround, for example, merge and form a, let's say, super left and right. And the Sonos Ones act as a traditional rear surrounds. After adding the sub, we get a 5.1.2 system. Eight official channels, though Super 8 seems more appropriate. The Q990B. They treat speakers like it's hot sauce. They put that shit on everything. It's a 7.0.2 bar, so seven ear level channels, center, left, right, surround right and left, and wide angle right and left. Naturally, there are two upward firing channels as well, front height, left and right. The surrounds, also freaks, come in hot at 2.0.1 channels, when 1.0 was the norm until about five minutes ago. So they offer not one, but two ear level channels, one pointed directly at the listener, a traditional rear, and the other towards the wall to simulate a separate side rear surround channel. And just one channel up top. Boring. Add in the sub and you land on an 11.1.4 channel system. 16 channels. You won't find a soundbar system with more than that. At the time of this recording anyway. On paper, the Q990B seems the most equipped to battle your sonic cynicism. The Sony HTA9. Each speaker has a forward and upward firing driver. It's softly advertised as a 7.1.4 system, even without a sub, which is what being very generous with yourself sounds like. After recalculating with my old school math, I landed on a 4.0.4 system. With the sub, it's a proper 4.1.4, which sounds a little stingy, but is one more official channel than the ARC. But as I mentioned in my recent review of the A9, this system is not engaging in that traditional channel count race. Instead, emphasis is being placed on their proprietary 360 spatial sound mapping technology, which according to Sony forms a sound bubble via an array of up to 12 phantom speakers born from the interactions of the four real speakers. Sony double dares you with the claim that the four speakers can be placed in a number of arrangements without material sound degradation. Phantom speakers are coming and they can't be stopped. Worth mentioning, I think, not all channels are created equal. The 990B and 1200, for instance, have nine drivers or mini speakers in the front of the bar, specifically a dual woofer tweeter trio for the left, center, and right channels. The ARC, just seven drivers up front as the left and right channels are merely a woofer tweeter pair. 
Rear speaker channels are typically just a single woofer or tweeter. The HGA9 and the Sonos Ones have a woofer tweeter pair constituting their ear level channels. I couldn't stop myself, I made a spreadsheet. All right, utility. First up, supported audio codecs. At this point, we only have low lights as we have certain expectations from our flagship soundbar-ish systems. That is full Dolby support, so think Peak Atmos, Dolby's 3D audio format layered on Dolby's premier lossless codec, Dolby True HD. Full DTS support up to DTS-X, which is embedded in the lossless DTS HD master audio format. And multi-channel LPCM, which is the lossless format Apple TVs and consoles output. All of that should be baseline for any flagship system being sold at the time of this recording. These are all flagship products. Low lights. Neither the ARC nor Cinema 1200 support DTS HD Master Audio, and by extension, DTSX. The ARC maxes out at lossy DTS 5.1, and the 1200 doesn't even know what we're talking about. Obviously, it's fair to say that neither of these systems are for you if you're jazzed about binging your epic DTS HD Master Audio Blu-ray collection on your new expensive sound system. Ports. Everyone's got eARC, which at this point is approaching standard, so we're gonna not even smile because it's like buying a car with four wheels. Okay, let's back up. What is eARC? What is eARC anyways? Let's back up even more. What is ARC? What is ARC anyway? Great question, young man. Well, it stands for Audio Return Channel, which is an HDMI port that like other HDMI ports can receive video and audio. But it's a special HDMI port in that it can take audio signals from the TV and send it to the soundbar. I can already hear some of you saying, hey, that doesn't sound that special. Optical and aux cables have been doing that for a long time. Sure, sure, but ARC, or ARC, however you want to do it, can send higher quality, more gadgety audio like Atmos and it can send other signals from the TV to the soundbar, like volume and power controls, making it easier to control the bar with the TV remote. What eARC affords you over plain old vanilla ARC is the option to send premium lossless audio formats, like the ones we just talked about, to your soundbar direct from the TV if, and this is a big flaming if, your TV also has eARC. 2020 through 2022 was the rapid transitional period where seemingly every middling to high-end TV adopted eARC. So if your TV is a 2019, be very nervous. So perhaps the most pertinent question, assuming some significant portion of you don't have an eARC TV yet, and you also want into the lossless audio game, is the number of HDMI inputs a soundbar possesses so that you have ample opportunity to hand off your premium sound to the soundbar first, unviolated by your crappy TV, and then have the soundbar via its ARC or eARC port send video to the TV, hopefully maintaining the refresh rate and HDR of the original source. Yes, it's fair to assume that if your TV supports refresh rates like 4K 120 Hz, that the TV supports eARC and you can just plug straight into the TV. In this case, maybe you just need extra HDMI inputs because there are no more ports left on your TV and or plugging into the soundbar simply helps to hide wires. Lots of good reasons to desire HDMI inputs in your soundbar. Highlights. Both the 1200 and the Q990B have two HDMI inputs. The bad news, both pass only up to 4K 60 Hz. The 1200 does claim 8K pass through, which suggests 2.1 compatibility, but it seems as though they are not fully meeting the 2.1 spec. Shining brighter and less bright at the same time, the HDA9 has only a single HDMI input, but is full-on Yeehaw 2.1 compatible, supporting 8K 30Hz and 4K 120Hz pass-through, which makes only having one that much more annoying. In terms of passing HDRs, the 1200 is the winner supporting both Dolby Vision and HDR10+. Well, the Q990B supports HDR10+, and unofficially Dolby Vision. 
and the HTA9, Dolby Vision, but only up to HDR10. They forgot the plus. The ARC leads from behind with no inputs. If you want the ARC and your TV does not have eARC, you can buy the HD Fury Arcana, which sends your Blu-ray sound or whatever to the bar in its lossless state and the video to the TV. It's expensive, costing $250. So maybe save that for your TV upgrade. Gonna give the 1200 a little more love by calling out their music positive optical and aux inputs that offer the opportunity to hook up streamers, turntables, other dust collectors that shouldn't be collecting dust. Okay, I suppose I should call out the Q990B's perhaps top marketing talking point. You can now play Atmos and DTSX content to the bar wirelessly via Wi-Fi from high-end 2022 Samsung TVs. I just tried it, it's super easy. There is no like Wi-Fi setup or anything. The option shows up in sound outputs and settings. With limited testing, the sound seemed pretty solid. So this lazy option makes it easier to hide wires, but renders the other bar inputs useless as the Q990B is now only an audio output, like a Bluetooth speaker, no longer an input. Sound adjustments. Room tuning functionality is the norm. The 1200 lost the memo. ARC has its true play tuning system, which is pretty mature at this point, though at the time of this recording, it's still only offered to iOS devices. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why other than that they're better. The Q990B, Yowzers, multiple room tuning technologies, including SpaceFit Sound, which recalibrates the system periodically, but automatically using built-in bar microphones. The Q990B dropped the requirement to have a Samsung TV to be SpaceFit Sound compatible. Very nice. But if you happen to have a 21 or 22 high-end Samsung TV, you get SpaceFit Sound Plus. Um, I'm not sure why Samsung is trying to encourage you to buy new Samsung TVs. Perplexing. Auto EQ, the user-initiated option. This uses a microphone in the base module to refine its response based on room conditions. The A9, yep. They got their sound field optimization, which as far as I can tell, is the room tuning function you shall not skip. This system without tuning sounds a bit drunk. Add a sub module, move a speaker, give a speaker a funny look, re-optimize. All the systems have dialogue and night modes. The 1200 has multiple levels of both, but only three systems offer you sound mode choices for normal listening. The 1200, Q990B, and the A9. In broad terms, it's typical to have a no funny business mode. So let's call it artist intent mode where channels are used as intended. Also something like a cinematic mode where the system finds an excuse to use all the speakers no matter what. Really most modes default to using all channels as I think most customers want the entirety of their sound system to make noise most of the time. I suspect customers complain otherwise. The Q990B and HGA9 have carved out something like a smart mode, so adaptive sound and auto, respectively, where the system classifies the sound content and intelligently adapts. Klipsch doesn't call out this kind of mode specifically, though standard mode, which Klipsch says is suitable for all forms of audio, I suppose is their closest offering. On the A9, as with many Sony soundbars, you have the immersive audio experience or immersive AE. I like to think of this as an audio overlay that heats up the high channels and tweeters and makes the sound more spatial. In let's say a less than subtle fashion. On some sound modes like cinema, immersive AE is forced on. Sonos, I'm sure would say an adaptive mode is the only one they offer and the only one customers should want and need. EQ controls, three of the four systems give you some levers. The Q990B offers the most at seven frequency bands, but only when set to the standard mode. Otherwise, just space and treble. Sony, not so keen on you EQ dinking with their expertly crafted sound, at least with this system. So no EQ controls. 
For channel level control, however, each system gives you something. Klipsch and Samsung do seem to be the most generous. The Arc does let you differentiate how loud you want to surround, depending on whether you're consuming music or TV. And in those occasions that you are streaming music, you have the option to use the surrounds as a separate stereo pair or as ambient sound fillers. Note, music over HDMI is treated as TV. Connectivity, let's talk highlights and lowlights. Sonos, whose core DNA is all about getting music from the internet, Get in my bed. just kind of wipes the floor with everyone in terms of integrated services. They have adopted a tight integration model with specialized software for their ecosystem with a refinement that I believe to be unrivaled. A low light, the Arc is a little elitist as it supports neither Bluetooth nor Chromecast. So a little cold to our less fortunate Android brothers and sisters. All of the systems have some support for some combination of Google Assistant, Alexa, Bluetooth, AirPlay, and Chromecast. The HTA9 is the only one that supports all of these. If you're looking for a built-in microphone for voice assistant support, the Arc and the Q990B are your only two options of the four. Alexa. Okay, gonna touch on high res. That is music with a higher bit depth and sampling rate than CDs, which is 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz. So let's think super CDs or whatever. Now, I imagine you want to achieve high res by sitting on your couch with your phone, blinds closed, playing music from a streaming service, not from a digital library you probably don't own. Really only the Arc and A9 offer that kind of experience. With the Arc, you can play high-res music from either the Amazon Music Unlimited or Koba's integrated service. Amazon Music Unlimited offers Ultra HD, their way of saying high-res, at the $9 a month or $90 a year tier. So that is probably the most economical option for most. If you're more a Cobuzz kind of chap, make sure to enable high-res Sono streaming in the Cobuzz website settings. There is no reason anybody would know they have to do this unless told directly. The A9 supports high-res over Bluetooth, so you can choose from a larger pool of high-res providers like Apple Music and Tidal. But LDAC is not supported on iOS devices, so reaching high-res continues to be too complicated. How do you confirm you're having a high-res experience? With your ears, of course, but if you need a confirmation from the system itself, the rate will show as an overlay on your TV. With the Arc, you can confirm streaming quality in the app's now playing screen. Stream quality is impacted by your network and whatever is happening on the streamer servers, so the Ultra HD tag sometimes takes a while to show up. Playing music over HDMI, like from Apple Music, gets you CD quality lossless, but not high res. But for whatever reason, I think it sounds better even than a high res stream. I just sense these systems mix the sound better when they think they're playing video. System modularity and expandability. So I wanna to touch on options for how to construct these systems and how you can go even bigger or smaller than what I'm showcasing here. Though, I think it's fair that I'm representing the most common configuration for each system. Klipsch has a sub out port, both on the bar and on the wireless sub, perhaps allowing the imagination to get a little overheated. Let's just say you can easily go one or two subs. The alternative or second sub could be any powered sub that takes in input from a sub out port. The 1200 does not sell its sub separately, so you're not getting two of them unless you buy another Cinema 1200, but then you would need two remotes. The Arc home theater setup. The beastliest configuration is the Arc with two Sonos 5s and two Gen 3 subs. A formidable pairing that would fall well over the $3,000 line. Some price reduction options would be to go with the Sub Mini. I haven't tested it, so I can't recommend. It's also not recommended by Sonos, but I imagine it's better than no sub and IKEA speakers, many of which falling below the Sonos One SL's $200 per price point. Perhaps the best deal is this pair of Symphonisk speakers for $240. Again, haven't tried it, so can't really recommend, but something to think about. 
a little more pricey and decorative, but you might also consider the Symphonisk picture frames. I use those in my bedroom. They sound surprisingly good, a little brighter than the Sonos ones, but look a lot better. If you are committed to the Q990B and don't have space behind you, you can opt to use the surrounds in the front for a killer front soundstage. In terms of traditional components, you're stuck. No more speakers can be added, but if you have a somewhat new high-end Samsung TV, you can leverage the TV speakers via Q-Symphony, expanding the total number of channels from 16 all the way up to 22. Still no option for a second sub. The Q900 series is kinda committed to the WibbyWig buying model, which is a weak point for them. The A9 can be paired only with a single sub. So either the SW5, the one I'm showing off, or the more diminutive SW3. It seems like Sony would be in a good position to allow for two as they already sell subs separately. As you might have heard, there is an S Center out port on the A9, which is intended to be used with Sony TVs for the purpose of using the TV speakers as a center channel. In general, and this applies to Samsung too, don't get too excited about mixing your TV speakers that you're trying to run away from with your higher quality speakers. What gives? Rather than a Sony TV, I'm thinking Sony should let customers use one of their soundbars as a center speaker. Never mind, take that back. Now my whole audience is hot and bothered. Anyway, I do understand that there is some significant consternation that the A9 does not include a center speaker. I can't expand on that particular controversy when we talk sound. Okay, that concludes the utility section. Ranking is tricky, but I'm gonna start that fire anyway. I will admit I was somewhat split between the ARC and HTA9. The ARC is just so strong on the music content, swappability, upgradability, all the ecosystem stuff. But the absence of Bluetooth, high-end DTS support, and HDMI inputs makes it a hard sell as top utility home theater product. The A9 kind of covers all the fanboy bases with an HDMI input, 4K 120 Hertz, 8K Dolby Vision pass-through, tight integration with the PS5, AirPlay, Chromecast, and high-res Bluetooth. It does fall a little short when it comes to sound shaping and lacks a microphone, but I suppose has a strong argument that it should be held in the highest esteem in this specific category. So from highest to lowest, HTA9, ARC, Q990B, 1200. Usability, let me start by discussing the display and bar controls. The display, if you're interested in seeing the dang thing, the 1200 is your bar. It's the kind of display your wife would make if you mentioned her display was too small. The ARC, it definitely has a display. It's just minimalist. Four LEDs that try to tell you as much as they can with pulsing and color. Kudos to Samsung and the Q990B for digging deep and moving the display from the top as it was in the two prior years to the front. Very brave. Though it's still pretty small and fairly difficult to see from across a big room. The A9, similar problems. The scrolly displays give you the kind of information you would expect from volume to EQ channel levels, sound modes, inputs, and Dolby Atmos confirmation. And I'm happy to confirm that all these displays can be turned off. There is an additional display that deserves a more official call out. The A9 offers an on-TV interface for setup, managing inputs, presenting audio, volume. It's appreciated and a visually accessible tool. The limitation and perhaps why it's not more widely adopted is that video information overlays are available only on video sources plugged into the A9 control box. So you would get an A9 overlay on your Apple TV interface, but not your smart TV interface. The rhyme and reason behind this inconsistency may not be obvious to all customers. Bar controls, the Cinema 1200. Four clickety buttons, power, source, and volume, up, down. Very basic. The Q990B, four physical buttons, multifunction, volume, up, down, and mic mute. The multifunction button doubles as a power on, but not off, button, and source toggle. The A9, it has as many bar controls as it has soundbars. The Sonos Arc, the interesting one, 
deceptively capable given its minimalism. So there are three main controls, a volume down, volume up, and a play pause. They're all capacitive. The play pause acts as a mute unmute if video is playing and a play pause button if streaming music. At the very least, there should always be a mute button because the sound may accidentally be very dangerously loud and volume should be killable with a single press on a thing that is easy to find, like a soundbar. Having a pause button is better than a mute button because ideally, audio only files should just stop when you're not listening. The ARC can't pause the TV video, so it just mutes the volume. In addition, there are a handful of touch patterns and gestures that broaden control of streaming media. Hold the play pause to play audio playing on other speakers. And you can play the previous track with a right to left swipe and a skip track with a left to right swipe. Swipes start and stop on the two volume buttons. On the top right of the bar, there's a button to toggle the voice assistant mic. When the adjacent LED is lit, the mic is active. The rears have the same controls and can be used in a similar fashion. So three points of control just from the components, which can be very convenient and is absolutely not normal. Okay, I'll put it out there. I think ARC wins usability hands down, and I wanna say those that have owned multiple soundbar systems, including the ARC, should fall in line and agree with me. First thing, the ARC is a straight up coal burning anti-green energy monster. Bad for your power bill, great for maintaining a connection and responding quickly to your wake the f up commands. Second, the ARC doesn't have any other HDMI inputs, so your friend's mom won't go months without sound if you happen to have adjusted an input setting on her soundbar. The ARC does the best job of being an invisible extension of the TV, as opposed to a separate gadget attached to your TV that you need to manage. Third, Sonos did the hard work of creating proprietary robust pairing technology that takes, yes, a few more minutes to set up than a plug and play, but is far more robust, making it less prone to cutouts and distortion. Fourth, the app. It's mature, attractive, stable, capable with its media search and multi-component control. It maintains the strongest and quickest connection with your system and feels like an integral part of the Sonos family, where typically other apps come across as a requirement that has been technically satisfied. Fifth, the components are given loving care for about a decade. Well, before Sonos threatens to brick them and then say, just kidding. Further, components can function with components years older or younger. Sixth, yeah, that's right. Want to talk Sonos integrated services. And what I kind of want to call out here is why they are better than Bluetooth, AirPlay, and Chromecast. Well, first off, they support a higher bit rate, so that's great. But probably of greater practical import is that they free your phone audio because when you play through an integrated service, music goes from the provider servers to your bar. Your phone is just directing as opposed to hosting. So you can play that video your friend sent you without stopping your music. My favorite parts of the app include the unified content search where you can scour across all your services. Cross-platform search is difficult to come by. And the ease of grouping and ungrouping different speakers for different multi-room pairings. Sonos has focused on an exceptional user experience and I think they have earned whatever halo they have. You can't get there with just slick marketing. Sony and Samsung, they are massive companies with massive portfolios and simply aren't structured at delivering the same kind of focus experience as Sonos. Smart things might be the best app for controlling your washer and speakers, but not the best app for controlling just speakers. Sony and Samsung offer a reasonable user experience. It's not special or exceptional. It's pedestrian. That being said, Samsung's app, Smart Things, does seem to place a particular emphasis on sound shaping, which I think is a good use for prime real estate in their app. The Sony Music Center app focuses on giving you quick links to other music apps on your phone, which is quite frankly, below their station, super cheesy, amateur hour. But Sony did an impressive job of hiding sound adjustment options behind two menu layers. So they're unlikely to get in the way 
of the Spotify link. Both the Q990B and the A9 come with a remote. The Q990B takes on the global Samsung form. I think you kind of get the idea. Toggles for volume and bass level, quick links to the most common sound adjustment controls. Though I'm not sure why the soundbar gets a dedicated input button when the TV remotes don't. That omission really gets me fired up. The A9 remote, as with all Sony remotes these days, was sent to us from the mid 90s. Most of what you'll need is at the single press level as they crammed in over twice as many buttons as the Samsung remote. Note that the remote requires line of sight with the control box, which is a potential pain point as you would have good reason to hide it because it doesn't make any sound and the display is too small. You cannot manipulate all the control box functions with the app, like room tuning, so the remote is more than nice to have, unfortunately. Okay, the 1200. So when I first reviewed the bar, it worked halfway decent, with some quirks no doubt, though I thought the sound was too big to be ignored. I was generally positive in my review and even made a funny face on my thumbnail. Okay, so yes, calling the initial version of the app anything but useless would have been a distinction without a difference. And yes, it was a big miss that a system with a 50 pound sub would not offer EQ controls. In spite of all that, I was still a big fan of the bar and have the same unit I reviewed over a year ago. Anyway, the big update finally came, the one intended to fix the things I just talked about. Well, gosh darn, if that update didn't just the whole system. So anyway, after this update, the app couldn't maintain a connection with the bar, constant full system cutouts, air leaking pneumatic-like sounds from, I don't know exactly where, I was too annoyed to investigate, endless manual power cycles for, fingers crossed, 30 minutes of uninterrupted sound. Total bummer, full stop. It gave me a serious case of the soundbar blues, which is not a real thing, but it should be. I eventually found it within myself, the time to seek out some solutions. Acquiring the fix or firmware update file required a real life conversation with Klipsch customer support, as opposed to pressing an update button on your app. And that Klipsch customer support, maybe because their bar completely crapped out, a little edgy. I uh, detected some attitude. Anyway, after those delightful conversations, I was led to the realization that to sideload the firmware update, you need to gather some archeological tools and uncover an ancient era of your life when a USB stick with no more than eight gigabytes of capacity was a thing. I'm an optimist and I'm old as hell, so I was sure I could find it. I was wrong. So I resigned myself to purchasing one. Well, it turns out such pathetic thumb drives aren't sold separately these days. So you have to buy five trillion at a time so you can swag them out at conventions. Okay, so I had to wait three to four days for my truckload of four gigabyte sticks to arrive, then go through a tens of hours process to get updated because once you update the various modules, which takes about an hour, you have to wait up to 24 hours for some mysterious invisible automatic OTA update to occur to confirm that the whole dang ordeal was successful. Long story short, I sense people have shown limited interest in this bar due to the sound and price probably, but that price thing shouldn't be an issue because the price just went down to $1,000. And I really don't think sound was the right reason to shy away. The biggest reason should be their software situation. But I believe in redemption, and based on my most recent experiences preparing for this review, the bar behaves far better. The app is much more likely to connect, stay connected, and the app has far more utility than when first launched. I did the firmware update months ago, so I'm pretty confident that any new system would come with the latest software. It seems you're on the right track, but you're still on a pretty strict probation for prior offenses. The 1200 remote. It's unique in shape, backlit, straightforward. It cannot do all the things the app can do like EQ adjustments, so bad planning there. And you have to aim it just right at the bar display area to get the commands to register reliably. Annoying for sure. 
Usability ranking, number one, ARC, the Q990B, the HTA9, and last, the Cinema 1200. The sound, the Cinema 1200, and Cinema Performance. I categorically think the 1200, sound-wise, is underrated as a movie-loving soundbar. I'll give those that only want to watch DTS movies a pass. But that's not most of you. Most of you are probably streamers, and the few Blu-rays you have are like 70% Dolby tracks. Consistent with the system's general theme, the sound is a bruiser. It's pounding and punishing. I think in the way we want it to be. But that doesn't mean it's merely a lunk. It has some art to it. If you disagree, well, at the very least, now you have a more complete tool set to rein in perceived excesses. I'm not certain, but I also tend to think that since the initial release, the updates have perhaps refined the base module's response to try to keep the baby and rid of some more of that bathwater. The sub absolutely makes itself known at times, but base levels generally seem like an appropriate match to the bar's masculinity. Another compliment. I think the sound, while intense, does kind of maintain Klipsch's earthy sound and vibe. The sound does seem to be shaped by humans, not droids, which I think perhaps makes it a little less taxing after a two hour movie. The 1200 presents admirable detail and atmospherics, and even an appreciable amount of directionality. The bar's ear level speakers point straight at you. There are no side firing speakers or phase guide channels to eke out a greater sense of space. Though there is certainly some funny business going on in movie mode that makes the front sound significantly wider than the bar. The height effects are acceptable, though I tend to think the bar makers must be willing to DSP the heck out of the sound to supercharge the height effects. I sense that Klipsch didn't really want to go that way, or maybe didn't know how to go that way, which, either way, is fine on my end. If you really crave spatial effects, with this bar your best bet is to spread the rears as far as you can and not sit too close to any one of them. I did notice some pretty convincing rear directional effects in the Dune sandstorm scene, watching the bug ship tail whipping around. Mad Max? It made my ears bleed. In the fun way. So about that dialogue. I do at times find it a little underdefined when the dialogue mode is set to zero, yet setting that mode to just one ups the artificiality more than I prefer. So instead I tweak the treble up just a bit, which seems to mostly do the trick. But you know, you wanna give your soundbar an enthusiastic dialogue endorsement, and I just can't quite do that here. Music playback. Okay, minor detour. This system expresses its greatest incompetence when playing the spoken word, so let's say podcast or YouTube, over Bluetooth. At times, the voice or voices, all sounding like crap, would all play on one side of the bar. Once around would play noise that you could barely hear, maybe some wet mouth sounds or something like that. The other surround wouldn't play at all, and the bass sounded as though it's on its last breath. Playing music services over Bluetooth is passable, but perhaps substandard. It just didn't click for me. I wasn't digging the balance nor richness, and it just left me wanting more. Chromecast, nothing special, but better. Go that route if you want to play wirelessly. On the other hand, the bar sounds, okay, not top tier, but dang fun when playing music via HDMI. Apple Music yielded some great tones, fullness, and balance. The 50 pound bass barge cut it up on the dance floor even with really fast rhythms and songs like Gasoline from The Weeknd. Really satisfying, deep, yet nimble thumps. Music mode, where the front and rear go stereo, sounds too heavy-handed. The 1200 is not a stereo system. It's best not to treat it as such. The Samsung Q990B, cinema performance. This is my second go at this system, and it's still an overwhelmingly good story, which is annoying because my first impulse is to be a meanie. I'm trying it out in a new listening space this go around, and the first aspect that jumped out at me is how attacky and nimble the sound is. This applies to effects spanning the frequency range and is a great tool for emphasizing directionality and generally manipulating your emotional state, as this system can pummel you with a sound wave and just vanish. The dynamic range is quite marvelous. The sound comes across as somewhat live with a slight modern bent, 
This lends itself well to textured dialogue and an atmospheric sound. So the tweeters are certainly put to work in this system. I did finally get around to watching Ford versus Ferrari. Oi, what a showcase for this system with all those old school engine sounds. Mmm, it's a delicious, high calorie oral experience for sure. Atmos and spaciousness, it's quite good. There is no shortage of 3D objects popping up in places where speakers aren't, like treats. Like otherworldly voices and drum sequences in Dune just floating above the soundbar. Nonetheless, this is a soundbar-centric system, meaning that while the soundbar is admirably diffuse, the soundbar is the focal point, which makes the world you are trying to inhabit a bit more walled in than you would get with a wider separation in the front. Again, getting those rear speakers as far away from you and each other really helps to push those sound walls out. Though as good a job as the soundbar does in bouncing sound off the walls, in the end, you are not so much in a bubble, but some kind of rhomboid structure with a wider, lower resolution world behind you and a narrower, higher resolution scene in front. Music, I'm a fan. Rich textures, surprising clarity, a nimble low end. Per usual, I prefer music via HDMI on these systems, but AirPlay sounded really good on this bar as well. Listening to Wild Blue by John Mayer, nice song, silly music video, the 80s guitar riffs just sing, suspended in air something like six feet above and two feet beyond the left edge of the soundbar. The sound transported me back to my elementary carpet sitting 80s days when my dad would fire up the Dire Straits and we'd listen to Mark Knopfler solos in stereo. The Q990B serves up a huge dish of sound competency. A modern wonder for sure. The interesting case of the Sony HTA9 is it the richest, fullest sound? Uh, no. Is it the most detailed sound? Probably not. Does it have the most neutral sound? Mm. Most impressive bass? Tough sell. Is the HTA9 proficient at all of these? Yes. So what does the $2,300 buy? Three words. Space space, and I forgot the last one, but we'll just go with space. Your soundbar can have more sides than you can count, but there is just no replacement for front separated speakers pointing right at you. Coupled with extremely sophisticated digital signal processing, a missing component in a traditional surround setup. With this system, you finally have a legit front soundstage that matches the rear that gives the sound more symmetry. Hence, the perceived walls of the sound are pushed out and the sound motion from side to side, corner to corner, is just more convincing and reliable. The spatial effects are just more likely to land. All of this categorically moving you closer to inhabiting a world you are used to merely observing. The strongest spatial effect I have experienced to date was the plane landing scene in Ford vs. Ferrari during the Mustang reveal. I might as well have taken a lawn chair to the landing strip. Also, those car parts flying at you near the beginning of Le Mans. Did I duck like a preschool kid with the sound of lethal metal shards whizzing past my ear? You'll never know. I'm gonna double down. If you are shopping around for peak spatial effects amongst the soundbar-ish lineup, don't buy a soundbar. You probably wanna buy the A9. The bad stuff. There are definitely some speaker dropout issues, and this system suffers catastrophically when it happens, like a wheel flying off your car on the highway. When it happens, it happens a lot, forcing some kind of action, probably in the form of a power cycle, on the affected speakers along with the control box. I found that to be the necessary bumbling hammer to make it stop. I did notice that when video was streamed through the control box and audio played via my projector, that the sound would be choppy there too. So the cutout issue is at the very least not completely attributed to wireless connectivity. Not great either way, cold comfort. I also noticed at one point the voice sync got pretty bad with a Blu-ray. A pause and play synced it right back up, but I don't wanna have to do that. I hate to admit it, but there started to be too many sound malfunctions in this latest round of testing and it makes me a little nervous because I kind of want to use this as my new sound system. 
I'm also not in shambles quite yet because these hiccups did seem to be easily resolved relative to other kinds of problems I've encountered reviewing these things. I also suspect I might be able to resolve some of these issues with more investigation. Music playback. It's exactly what you want if you are seeking slick, shiny, shimmery, clean sounding tracks. So Taylor Swift, you go girl, The Weeknd, Fleetwood Mac, Michael Jackson, Post Malone, Elton John, Prince, Bruce Hornsby, all that sounded right at home. On the other hand, 90s alt rock, Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Green Day, Bush, any kind of sound with high distortion fell really flat. Just straight up unpleasant made me sad. Though I don't think the unpleasant sound is so much a knock, but a compliment of sorts. Because, well, these are probably the best drivers of all the drivers I'm testing. And well, I suspect I am just receiving more details than I want or need from this style of music. Perhaps 90s alternative music was never meant to be heard with high levels of fidelity and digital signal processing. If you want to go against my advice and listen to scratchy content on the A9, I suggest switching to music mode and turning off immersive AE. It's less unpleasant. Assuming you're listening to complementary material, the spatial nature makes the system fun and modern, stimulating a novel experience. The play between the four corners prompts involuntary movements inspired by dancing. 360 Reality Audio offered by Tidal and Amazon Unlimited, high-res tracks. Well, I didn't sense huge differences or improvements. See, this system is always upscaling with their digital sound enhancement engine, DSEE. Most people can't tell the difference between MP3s and CDs, much less CDs and high-res. There is a whole video I could make on this topic that no more than five people would watch. And Sony is 360 spatial sound mapping all the content anyway. I actually want people to tell me I'm an idiot and that I should listen more closely to these enhancements. Worth noting, I have a really big open listening space. All the speakers are, let's say, 9 to 13 feet from me, 13 to 20 feet from each other. I think that kind of space is particularly flattering for this system. If you happen to be in a smaller space, which you probably are, and can't achieve much distance between speakers and yourself, the value proposition of this system, which is already strained by the very high Sony-like pricing, I'd say takes a major hit. The Arc system, totally nifty, but in the movie sound department, amongst these other bars, it doesn't rise to the top in any particular way. Perhaps the best way for me to frame the sound is Q990B Lite. Relative to the Q990B, this system just has fewer drivers throwing sound around to create rich layers. None of this is to say that it doesn't sound really impressive in some sort of an objective sense, but relatively, it's a step down from the Q990B and layering and richness, the 1200 and brutality and sound volume, and the HTA9 in spaciousness. Admirable, but not spectacular directionality and Atmos performance. Sonos also seemed to lack lip sync mismatches and rear speaker cutouts. So it got kind of boring not getting enraged by those missing quirks. A simple request for Sonos. You are overdue for a new, refreshed, theater-oriented surround speaker with upward-firing drivers. Sonos, yes, you've been going democratic of late, introducing increasingly affordable home theater options to broaden the customer base and to form new addicts. Anyway, let's take a short breather from that and get back to improving the expensive stuff. Thanks. Soundbar Dan. Music performance is unsurprisingly highly competent. My tech addict dark side wants to dismiss playback because it's not the newest thing anymore. But every time I make an effort to sit for a second and listen to some music, it's always delightful and clearly holds up as a very solid purchase. As modern a company as Sonos is, the Arc does not have the most modern sound. So perhaps it lacks some of those titillating moments you might get from the A9. I know some people have described Sonos Arc sound as muddy. I think that's probably going too far. In general, I find the Arc sound to be fairly neutral, maybe coming in second after the 1200. 
So I would say it's perhaps not the most natural companion to ultra-modern type songs or mixing, but complementary to more genres than, say, the HTA9. It was difficult to believe how much better Pearl Jam sounds on the ARC than the HTA9. Based on my A9 discussion, I'm not sure if this is a diss or a compliment. Bottom line, I think it's a really solid and pleasing music delivery system to the point that I think you need to be a bit cynical to take a dismissive stance. Finally, sound ranking, cinema, uh, Q990B. This bar manages to deliver sound with quality spatial effects, an audio stage that extends well beyond the limits of the bar while sustaining a natural, rich sound. Bravo. I don't want to say two, so 1B, the HTA9. It just crushes the spatial effects and is extremely thrilling. The sound is clean and uncluttered, but the mids are undervalued and the sound is a bit too processed for me to take first prize. Three, it's a tough one, the 1200. Spatial effects outdo the Sonos Arc and it's just a beast that can pound like the others can't. I can't say I want it unleashed all the time, but I want it in my high drama action movies. Hate to say it, lasts the Sonos Arc system, the most reserved, least risky sound. It just failed to bring something special to the cinema oral experience as the other bars did. Though still a very competent bar for cinema, let's not get it twisted. Music, the Q990B, the fullness and balance of sound. It's flattering to a wide variety of musical styles, adept at 2.1 to Dolby Atmos music, and everything in between, regardless of music source. Second, the arc. Delightful in pretty much all the ways the Q is, but on a less impressive scale. Three, the HTA9. While it's not flattering to already distorted music, it just crushes the fast-paced modern shimmery pop sound. And last, the Cinema 1200. It has limitations playing music streamed from a device, and its somewhat brutish nature makes it my least preferred. But don't get me wrong, it can keep a party moving with music over HDMI until a mom tells you to turn it down because the kids want to watch dino trucks. The best system, considering the whole package, and you're a billionaire that didn't buy Twitter, so money is no issue. Number one, and you're gonna freak out, the Sonos Arc. The sound is less grand than the rest in some aspect or another, but it delivers the most consistent, well-rounded performance of the bunch. Further, I recognize that I tested these systems in a manner that is not reflective of average day-to-day -day use. Pushing it to the limit content and volume-wise to venture just how thrilling they can be. But for day-to-day -day use with chiller content and family-friendly volumes, some of those sound benefits from the other bars are diminished. To further my case, the ARC is embedded in the strongest ecosystem and has the most fully comprehended user experience. I sense maybe the highs won't be quite as high as the others during particular action scenes, but the potential downsides are much more shallow. And man, do those downsides stick with you. Again, this video is completely self-funded, so this is a personal, pure endorsement. I use only Sonos all throughout my living areas, except here in the basement, where I go a little crazy and play things like the A9. Number two, the Q990B, the richest, most nutritious sound that manages to avoid anything close to a catastrophic flaw. That is a high bar to hurdle, but it's also a loner that doesn't really cooperate with other audio systems you may have around the house let's say outside of AirPlay. I'm also bummed that it's not an upgradable system and it already has outdated pass-through specs. Sometimes the best sounding system is not the best system, even when it's a great system. Third, the A9. It plants its flag as owner of spatial effects. It has a refreshing, wide open sound that I wish you could all experience. Unfortunately, it's extreme sound processing unevenness with music, along with some too common cutout lip sync issues, 
makes me a little more hesitant about recommending the system than I was in my first review just a few weeks ago. Making it fair, I think, to place it firmly under the Q990B. Number four, the Cinema 1200. Largely, I'm putting it last because it's still on probation based on prior experiences. It lacks refinement in a number of ways, and it's pretty average on 3D effects. It's the hardest hitting bar, which I'll admit, I do like my chest cavity massaged, and the sound is rated quite high amongst the more objective types. It's not my imagination, the sound is dang good. Though, putting everything together, it's my least preferred all around system. Though, ironically, at $1,000, it's probably the highest value system. Some closing thoughts. Does the A9 need a center channel? And what does the ideal soundbar-ish system look like? The A9's dialogue in my listening space and to my sensibilities is exceedingly clear and present, perhaps in a way that a center channel may even detract from, as the 360 spatial sound mapping places the dialogue somewhere between the center of my skull and center of the screen. In any case, not some fancy noisemaker beneath the screen, which is not ideal, even if it sounds great. So no, I don't want a center channel for better dialogue. And I generally appreciate that with the A9, there is not a focal point dominating the sound. However, I do sense that adding additional speakers in a balanced way and or adding speakers with higher driver counts could lend itself to perhaps a more natural and richer sound, which I would appreciate. For instance, I would straight up buy Sony's fictional HTA 9000 with four additional speakers to place in between the corners if just to thicken the sound while maintaining spatial benefits. Same as I would immediately buy the fictional optional front Q990B speakers to take Samsung's rich sound and give it some more of that A9 spatial magic. I do sense that the revolutionary step in this space would be a hybrid of the A9 and Q990B that capitalizes on both their strengths. I think Sony, Samsung, and Sonos are most poised to fight this battle. Sony with their DSP chops, Samsung with all its acquired speaker knowledge from its many audio-oriented subsidiaries, and Sonos with its experience and high-quality modular swappable components. Yes, Sony and Samsung are far more experimental in nature, so I would expect bold moves from them first. I do hope that we can move into a more courageous phase, which does not rid of soundbars, but leaves them as the last best option for the techie consumer home theater space. Okay, I'm officially done. If you are still there, I truly appreciate your commitment and I'm befuddled by your lack of other engagements. I'll admit I am low-key rooting for this to be my biggest video yet, hopefully moving this channel to the next tier, whatever that may be, so kindly engage with the things to broaden this video's reach. All right, wrapping this up, catch you on the next one.